So now let's talk strategy and sort of tie together this stuff about role play <clears throat> and sort of tie up some running threads that go all the way back to the beginning of episode 11. We started out episode 11 based on the idea, an accusation, but also a sort of diagnostic. Is God arbitrary? See, the thing about absolute and arbitrary is that they look a lot alike on the surface. When you got, let's say, you know, outsiders are viewing a couple. If they know that that couple loves each other, then the behavior of that couple when one of the couple really screws up and the other one keeps on forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and overlooking, the people who know that the couple love each other are going to attribute that constant forgiveness as love, a kind of unconditional love even. It will be recognized so long as you already know what's going on inside the couple. Notice how we're now getting into role-playing. Role we're getting into knowing the other person's head, what's inside the head. Notice also how we're talking about an attitude of grace and appreciation for love itself, which also is preconditioned upon a knowledge base inside the outsiders, as it were, who are familiar with the couple. So one member of the couple will pretend to simplify the matter. Let's say one member of the couple keeps on screwing up and the other one just keeps on forgiving, keeps on forgiving, keeps on forgiving. Pretend that the one member of the couple keeps on being unfaithful. You know, screwing around with somebody else. And the other one just keeps on, you know, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Hurt or not. Because, you know, not all couples um, are jealous enough or insecure enough where infidelity is an issue, even when it occurs. Okay, that's not a permissiveness. Okay, it's actually possible for two people to be married to each other and if one keeps on being unfaithful, the other one is so secure in the love that the unfaithfulness just doesn't matter. Okay, is it wrong? Yeah, is the person hurt? Well, probably at times. But some people just aren't threatened by that, whereas other people are threatened by it. Even by, you know, one guy looking at another girl, the girl is threatened just because he looks. He wouldn't be a human being if he didn't look. Okay? But all those things are also dependent on the internal interaction of the personality with the facts and views and values. And it's also notice the dependency of those outside knowing or not knowing what's going on inside the couple. So now let's flip that. There are, let's say, strangers, associates at work, who really don't know the couple. But they hear through the gossipy grapevine, oh, well, Charlie cheated on his wife again. What does she see in him? You know, because they don't know anything. They're going to think she's being arbitrary, not faithful, not loving but just either stupid, brainless, uncaring, or maybe she's doing somebody too. They're going to come up with all kinds of ideas because they don't know what's going on with the couple. So that, see, absolute and arbitrary are going to look a lot alike to somebody who doesn't know the difference. And in fact, the world basically accuses God of being arbitrary. That's Satan's argument anyhow. Because, you know, if some disaster happens in some part of the world where, you know, a whole town is flattened, well, you know what, God must have done that and he must have been mean to do that. That's the assumption a lot of people make. 
that when some disaster happens to a person or to a region, oh, well, you know, why did God let that happen? It couldn't be possibly have any justification whatsoever. And, you know, the justification question itself is even narrowed to the person deserved it or didn't deserve it. The third idea, which is that, hi, maybe it's used for training. You know, because soldiers go through a lot of nonsense just to train. Nobody's doing it to them because they deserve or don't deserve. They have to go through nonsense to, to train so that in battle they can do a better job. Well, you know, why is that so limited to soldiers? What about the rest of us? If there's a God, wouldn't he be training us like a parent trains a, a child or a military trains a soldier? Bad stuff happens to train you in something. Not because you're bad or good. But that third idea never hits anybody. So, of course, God is deemed to be arbitrary or unjust. Arbitrary and unjust is the same argument. Absoluteness doesn't enter into the thought pattern. Okay? So... As we work through these questions about arbitrary or not, we realize that a lot of it depends upon what information do you have, what information do you want to get, do you want to actually work through that information to actually analyze a question, or are you just content to go along with the masses? And one of the things that I ended up doing was, you know, going through some of the mechanics of how anti-Semitism gets around to show that it's a combination of people just wanting to be against the Jews because it's a satanic motivation and people of their own reasons just want to be against the Jews. But it's also more often a go-along thing. So if Satan can deploy anti-Semitic attitudes in the right places with the nice voices, you know, respectably especially, then the 80%, 90% of the masses will go along because they go along with anything that's the mass view. Because the masses regard massing as God instead of God. That's really their view. They'll mouth God and they'll be real sincere about it. They're not lying. But the real God to them is whatever's common, whatever most do, whatever's mainstream. That's what they give credence to. It has to be mainstream, common, popular for them to give it any kind of respect or credence. Not that they ever really pay attention. Or they ever learn anything. But they won't even pay attention until something is popular. And at that point, it doesn't matter what it is. Okay? It all has to do is be popular, and and there's going to be a certain goal along with it, even if there's a lot of criticism. So that's how any idea, no matter how bad and stupid, becomes accepted wide, you know, populace wide. That's how anti Semitism gets accepted populace wide, and of course, Satan and company fan it. Now, if ever there was anything that was arbitrary, it's anti Semitism, but it stands for, you know, a wide variety of things. So. you end up having to fight against the masses inside your head you end up having to fight against non-thinking inside your head you end up having to fight against how you want to call it just buying ideas with too little analysis and homework inside your head. And of course, because you're doing all that fighting inside your head, it's going to be reflected in anything you say, and that's going to put you at, in conflicts with other people. Maybe, you know, a sort of cold war where you just sort of distance yourself from people or they distance themselves from you. But sometimes, you know, flat out arguments. Or even separations, it can get quite um, vituperative at times. So you're at war inside your own head, you're at war with your own desires and proclivities to be just like the masses, you know, lazy, not thinking, um, just be parochial, me, me, me. 
you're at war with those those proclivities inside the self and you're at war with those same proclivities in mass society which is dominant and you're at war specifically with particular individuals in your periphery cold war or hot war over the issues that are related to these kinds of problems in daily life on top of all that you're in a kind of war to learn God to see through his eyes what is it like for God to be God trying to just learn him and just even learning the Bible is a, a struggle because it's it's so poorly taught because theology is so puerile it's still in you know playpen and trying to just learn anything even basic about the Bible is, is a is it's not as hard as it was like 400 years ago, but it's still pretty tough because there's so much debate and there's so much disinterest that it's really hard to get to the meat of the issue and study the issue and even get enough information to where you can even think through the Bible verses themselves. So that's an, a war too. There's a war just to study the Bible. And then you got to try to practice it and that's another war. So you're doing all kinds of little warring, or you could call it practicing, or you could call it role-playing. And then you got role-playing with respect to, well, what kind of paces is God going to put you through, your dream come true, your worst nightmare, sort of role-playing that goal issue, role-playing how God thinks, seen through his eyes, role-playing seen through their eyes of the people around you, or even mock representatives of personality types, so you can get more familiar with the sort of big picture that is going on and then of course you're role playing um, different situations you might run into just for the sheer practice of it just like you practice different kinds of piano pieces or use different kinds of weapons okay so you've got all that role playing to do and that's pretty exhausting you're constantly monitoring your thoughts for whether you're sinning or whether what you think was a sin was really a temptation and do I need to use one Jama 9 and then using it quickly and bounding back because you don't ever want to spend too much time in self analysis not when you're in the middle of battle which is like every minute you know time for reflection usually comes at the end of the day or the beginning of the day and then you're constantly doing the planning thing. So there's a role playing that's like with respect to planning something out. Role playing the grand design. Okay. So that's a pretty that's a pretty exhausting day. All that stuff going on. Now in order to do all that well and organized you have to sort of have an overall strategy okay and the strategy basically boils down to what am I learning about God today what am I learning about the Bible today what am I learning about how to use it all today what am I learning in the role playing today now notice that's a strategy and yet it's expressed as a tactical goal for the day because that's always going to be how to live that day and we know that from Philippians 314 I've just expressed it in another way Philippians 314 is I'm pressing to the goal of the upward calling of our inheritance in Christ Jesus I'm paraphrasing it okay you just plod and plod and plod and that's actually a strategy it's obviously a tactic you call it a tactical strategy if you want and it doesn't sound like it would be grand strategy but it is because every moment of every day that you will ever live today tomorrow a billion years from now is the same goal every single day so and, and the reason I want to stress this is this depicts the punctilier nature of God his infiniteness the best 
Infinity is usually expressed as an ongoing iteration. That's not infinity. Okay, that is in fact the behavior of infinity. Something that goes on and on and on. It has to be repeated. Infinity, by contrast, is everything all at once. That a whole is encapsulated in any one, as it were, dot. And it's a logical dot. It's not spatial. Well, if that's true, if that's the definition of true infinity, and it's usually depicted as a sideways eight to show this kind of definition, then the goal, the life, everything about it has to have but one definition also. And it's the same as Philippians 3.14. You're, going, you're always one step forward toward God, toward knowing, you know, Bible better, toward knowing, you know, the role play better. It's a process that never ends. Now, that's a major paradigm shift in the way we think. We're always thinking about something way off in the future, that's some kind of, I don't know, how do you want to call it, uh, um, a quantitative goal of some given amount of knowledge at a future point in time or some given occurrence with X number of steps that precede it. You know, I'm going forward from my age today until death. It's that kind of thinking. Okay, but, that, but that's not God's nature. His nature is all big one now. So the goal today is the same as the goal a billion years from now. Quantitatively speaking, ideally, the way you know God and Bible and the others and yourself and the role play skills today is, is today less than it will be a billion years from now. That makes perfect sense to say that. But it's still the same process. It's still the same goal. The goal never changes. The process never changes. The degree of success and enjoyment and all the rest of it is ideally constantly increasing. And certainly will be constantly increasing in heaven after death. But the process doesn't change. So in a way, heaven began now. You don't have to die to get there because the goal is the same, the process is the same, the meaning is the same. You'll be living the same way then, post-death, in heaven, as you do right now. You just don't have the same competence, you just don't have the same amount of, of enjoyment and tools and understanding and competence that you do right now. But it's the same. So, your strategy, therefore, is which is Philippians 3.14. Because the goal is always more. If that's the strategy, if that's the grand strategy, and it also simultaneously is a tactic, therefore punctiliar, therefore infinite in nature. Because it, it, it takes up no space. There's no actual change. Then you don't have to get all tied up in knots about, you know, because... Uh, what I just said earlier when I started this. Oh man, it sounds tiring. Role play this, role play that, war inside, war outside, war with others, war to get the Bible, war to know God better, war to know, you know, get more confident. <laughs> of course, which is the same, you know, cadence as Philippians 3.14. Katas, kopon, dioko, ai, sto, brabe, te, sano, klesius, tu, te, yo, en Cristo, yeso. You know, plod, 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 plod. <sighs> I'm so tired. But, 
it's not tiring if it's always the same. Whatever you get done today, you got done today. Did you lose? Okay, but there's always tomorrow. So it takes away a lot of the angst. And it takes away a lot of the tiredness that normally we go through in a day. I mean, I don't know how many times this occurred to you, but a lot of times it occurs to me, man, my day was a waste. And how many days in the past before it were a waste? And when I look back on the things I thought were important when I was in my 40s and 30s and 20s, it's embarrassing. I wasted all that time on what I was going to wear or eat or who I knew or what did I own. I mean, I can't even imagine that at one time in my life, it mattered if I owned something that that people considered important. Once upon a time, I actually thought like that. Once upon a time, it mattered who you knew. That your importance as a person was gauged by who else you knew. Why did we ever come up with ideas like that? Why would that make one person... Why should I be more or less important based on who I know? And by the way... I know God. So what does it matter who else I know? I know the most important person in the universe. So if it, if I'm important based on who I know, well, honey, I know God. Of course, so do you. Ideally. And everybody can. So, you know, hello? I mean, see, we get ourselves all tied up in knots because we're always trying to get more which of course is the goal but we're trying to get more of the wrong things and they don't satisfy and we're always looking out at the future instead of at today because we're trying to get something we don't have today in the name of getting satisfaction at that future point and it's always the carrot right out in front of you that you grab at and you never quite reach. And so you're always going. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, you still didn't get the carrot. And you're like, oh. See the difference? See how similar and how different it is. The way the world is panting after stuff. And yet God's plan is exactly the same mechanism. But you reach the goal. That's the strategy for the day. And you've met the goal by the end of the day. Because, you know, it's the same today and a billion years from now. And if you didn't get more by the end of today, well, that's okay. There's tomorrow. So your hopes aren't dashed because, you know, you have to be, you have to own a Maserati to be important in your social circle. And you didn't earn enough money by this point in time to get that red Maserati. And it doesn't look like you're going to get it tomorrow. So, you didn't have to get it in the first place. Because the things that satisfy aren't like that. See how much better this is? See how this, how wise a strategy, the merging of opposites. I mean, because really, strategy and tactics are in many ways opposites. Strategy is like your grand plan. And you got to be real careful with grand strategy that you're going after an objective for the right reasons. Otherwise, the whole thing tanks. You know, that's like Pyrrhic victory. Tactic is how you go from, a, you know, from your where you are now to this grand strategy goal that you're planning for. Like if your grand strategy is to be in, in Rome at Christmas because you want to be with the family, okay, what are all the steps you have to take to get to that goal? 
Okay, but if you get to Rome at Christmas with your family and all everybody's going to end up doing is arguing with each other and very unhappy, then maybe the grand strategy shouldn't have been to go be at Rome at Christmas with the family. You see that point. Assuming that it was okay and a good thing to do, then you, tactics is how you get there. All right. But God's saying, hi, it's all one thing. Plod, plod, learn, learn, fight, fight, no, no. And that's the goal all in itself. And, you know, Holy Spirit's running the show. At the end of the day, there's going to be something, one. There's going to be always a lot of failure. But all that role playing and all that effort is going to pay off. Because that's the whole goal to start with. So I don't know how much this has helped. But when you see it like that, because God sees everything as a process. He sees the end from the beginning, but he's really not after you know, like, it, it, in God's way of thinking, unlike ours, in God's way of thinking, it's not about, hi, you're at this bad place now, and you're going to be at this good place later. As if between now and then has no value. It's every dot along the way, too. I have trouble learning that lesson, but I can at least say that's what it is. See how much sense it makes? God has to see the end from the beginning. If every dot in the process wasn't a total thrill for him, then why is creation the way it is? So if it's a total thrill for him, honey, that's the objective right now. There is a success right now. The goal is reached right now. And it sets up the potential for the next goal. It's always a win-win. Even when you fail. Because he's watching it. It has to be that way. So I don't have to tie up my panties in a wad if I screwed up today. Nor do I have to get all bent out of shape because somebody else screwed up today and whatever I thought my objectives were, they weren't reached. Because God's goals were reached. God teaches through failure or success. He already knew the end from the beginning. He already knew what each moment was, and he likes those moments. And he foreknows what they're going to be. If he didn't like them, he can change them, but he doesn't. So his objectives were reached. So what am I worried about? Well, as a human being, I'm going to be all focused on, well, see, I wanted to get there by 5 o'clock, and because this ding-dong, you know, ran a stoplight, and I missed, therefore, my light while I got there, you know, at six. And I can choose to be all tinked off and <laughs> about getting there an hour late. So I can be like, well, okay, God didn't want me to get there at five. I don't have to be mad at the other guy. And I don't have to be guilty at myself. And if somebody's going to berate me for being an hour late, it's like, well, this is why it happened. And I don't have to feel bad about it or try to coerce or, you know, Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm an hour late. I'm an hour late because blah, blah, blah. And I don't even have to blame the guy who made me late. It's the stoplight or whatever it was. Huh? Okay. I mean, we can choose to feel bad about an occurrence that doesn't meet our expectations or we can choose to write it off. Feeling bad about it isn't going to do any good. So, God's got it in hand. I don't have to worry about why it didn't work. Except, you know, for analysis purposes, the training didn't work. Isn't this cool? Peace out.